Good afternoon, everyone. This is what happens if you're a solar researcher and you're trying to warn the world about food shortages coming in 2028 because of a grand solar minimum. Notice what's talked about Russia and what should be said or shouldn't be said at the introduction of Professor Valentina Zarkova's speech at the Global Warming Policy Forum. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, great, great pleasure to, to introduce Professor Zarkova, uh, uh, who, who worked and studied, studied and, and graduated uh, in Kiev, in, in Ukraine, Ukraine, during, during a time when the, the Berlin, Berlin Wall was still there, standing, and the Iron Wall was still there, and the World War. So, so she knows a lot, a lot about, about what you're you allowed to say. And I hope you will make that, but she say anything that might be of your power. But she she uh, graduated in the uh, 1975. Now, food surplus gives rise to civilization. End of story. Not enough food, decline of civilization. And Professor Zarkova had used hundreds of thousands of years of oscillations of solar magnetic field research. She still stands by her forecast coming into a grand solar minimum. So much so that she included this slide, shortage of vegetation periods can lead to possible food shortages in 2028, need intergovernmental efforts to avoid disasters. She actually talked about governments stockpiling food right now to get through the lean times from 2028 to 2032. And during these uncertain times, I've teamed up with My Patriot Supply Long-Term Food Storage a nice affordable starter kit, two week food supply, 1500 calories per day, breakfast, lunch, and dinners, plus the four gallon storage containers included in that. This is a good first step in getting more self sufficient. And if you click through the Prepare with Adapt 2030 page in My Patriot Supply, you can get this starter kit for 75 bucks. Please remember there's a limit of two per household in this special offer. And if you're one of my patrons, take a look in your email box. I sent you the six-page report detailing the exact same forecast timelines and also things to think about as society moves forward and people become more aware of the situation around them, how the economy is going to behave, how people are going to pull money out of their savings, stocks, whatever it is, the economy is going to contract, and how people are just going to react once they realize this is a decade-long event and they're all on their own to prepare their own food organizing communities, and we'll see how there's a gargantuan shift in perception of what's possible. And as it's always been said, food surplus gives rise to civilizations. You'll find this through history. Every time there's excess agricultural production, civilizations and societies rise. Now on the inverse, when there's not enough food, they contract. We can see this through tens of thousands of years of history. Now, speaking of incredibly long timelines, during Professor Zarkova's presentation, this image for some reason was blocked out. The rest of the presentations there, I've linked it below so you can go right to the video at Global Warming Policy Forum, check out this entire presentation, excellent. Except when it comes to this and one other slide, talking about long time duration, suddenly it was obscured. But during the question and answer session, there was an incredibly overblown, overexposed image of this. I was able to enhance it, and this is what we have. Oscillations of solar magnetic field. And this is what Professor Zarkova had done, gone back at least 100,000 years, taking a look at the magnetic fields on the sun. And you can see this clearly, proponents of the electric universe. Look at the wave right here. This is not anything to do with an internally combusting star. This is an electrical wave right here in front of you. Now she also mapped it out into grand glaciation cycles going back 400,000 years. We have this incredibly long timeline to get a baseline, if you will. So when we take a look at the realization of just this 400 year segment of time, 
and all the cycles interwoven within just these last four centuries. Think about 400,000 years. If you're going to map that out, this 400 years of time would literally be just a pencil mark in time. Even if your graph was six feet long, this would still be pencil thickness of the amount of time in that entire cycle of grand glaciation. Her forecast stands as is solar cycle 25 declining and solar cycle 26 out almost no agricultural production from 45 north and above. Now to put that into context, this year alone between 5 and 8 percent of the global wheat crop was reduced. Also rye down 30 percent. Rice down about 5 percent. But others corn, soy, great harvest years. So when we progress between now and 2028, it's not going to be as if January 1st, 2028, there's suddenly food scarcity on the planet. It's going to be leading up to this. It's going to be a lead in to that point. So the question you might want to ask yourself is, over these next 10 years, is it going to be a linear decline or will there be huge drops one year and then the next year it'll flatten out maybe two years and then it'll drop off again? Just not sure what the declines will be moving forward to this looks like 80 to 90 percent reduced yields globally of what we're getting right now. The big red arrow, you are here. You're going to be here for another year or so until we get into solar cycle 25. There's a plethora of forecasts out there being a little stronger, about equal or less than this last solar cycle that we've experienced. Well, you've seen the massive weather changes in the last year. So as we move forward, if the solar cycle is even less intense as predicted, less than 50 sunspots averaged, well, we're going to see some types of things that haven't been recorded in centuries occur on our planet in a daily or weekly play out of the news. Take a look here at the magnetic fields of the sun. That's the graph above. When they get into that wide canceling wave, that's where the extreme weather is. And you can see how the solar activity declines matching that in the graph below. Now also in the question and answer session, Professor Zarkova referenced that each successive heat spike coming out of these warming events is getting lower and lower and lower. Now the modern warm period I disagree with. This is put out by NOAA and so far it's only 0.2 degrees Celsius above baseline. So where that red arrow is should be dropped at least 1 degree Celsius, possibly 1.3 degrees Celsius, which would bring us below the medieval warming period. With this slide here, please realize Professor Zarkova has been so tight-lipped about the effects on society due to the grand solar minimum. But suddenly, she comes out full force and says, possible global food shortages 2028 to 2032. You're going to need intergovernmental connection cooperation to stockpile now for these lean times later. Notice the top line also, we're going to taste it, feel it, and smell it in 2020. And it's just going to intensify. Now to put this in perspective, we're getting a wisp right now, a very mild taste of what's going to come. If she's putting 2020 as the categorical start date of this event, we're not even there yet. This is just a warm up to what's coming. So you've seen these massive weather events across the planet these last six months, a year worth of rain in Oman in a day. Six months worth of rain in so many spots across Europe, record snowfalls in August, record snowfalls in October, massive winds, and you're seeing it everywhere if you're even halfway paying attention to the news feeds across the planet. What's to come as we intensify into this is an unknown. But what is known is that Atlantic water temperatures are responsible for European cooling or warming. Now, the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation currently is going into its 60-year cool phase. And you notice all the blue. That's cooler than average water, and that's being pushed up under the Arctic ice sheet. David Dilley did some great research on this, and from this point forward, as the Atlantic cools, it's just going to be cooler water circulating under the Arctic circle there, which means that the ice should be thicker and remain thicker longer into the melt season. Now here's a graph for you, Climate for You, great place to stop and get a lot of research information. 
This is the 60-year Atlantic multi-decade oscillation. And you can see it's going to be trending down for the next 30 to 35 years. Plus, we're heading into the grand solar minimum. You'll hear everybody saying, the experts say it's not going to happen. The experts say that the warming is going to overtake the cooling. But what are these same experts giving us forecasts in the past? Let's take a look at the atolls, Kiribati. Red line is 2013, blue line is 1969. This is the amount of loss or gain on the atolls that are just feet above sea level. Kiribati was supposed to be the poster child for land loss due to rising seas. Maldives as well, but it's not happening in either of those places. So if you're going to look at the experts that have been telling you this would happen and it's not happening, well, I might seek a second opinion. Let's jump over to the report this came from. The conclusion was, over the past decades of the century, Atoll Islands exhibited no widespread sign of physical destabilization by sea level rise. To the contrary, that you were told everything's melting, Greenland's melting, the Arctic's melting, Antarctic's melting, and it's just going to cause all the sea level rise. And they've been telling us that since, what, 1990? So we have almost 30 years. You think if this was in play, it would have been in play by now when we'd have seen some changes in the sea levels, but nothing. Also, the same experts that guarantee that this warming of our planet is going to overtake the grand solar minimum. Well, this is 2016-17 ice gain on Greenland. The blue line, far above the 1981 to 2010 average. I thought it was supposed to be melting, but here it is gaining ice for last year. And as we progress into these few months as well, it's right at the baseline, 2018-19. So there's another prediction that's not panning out that was supposed to. I thought Greenland would be almost bare rock by now comparatively to what they told us in the 1990s. Again, 30 years, but here we're gaining ice. And another projection was there would be no sea ice in the Arctic during the summertime. We heard that in 2005, 2007, 2009, 2013, and there was even more ice this year. That's the amount of sea ice increasing at the moment. The narrative was also flipped slightly about the ice. Remember, it was always about the thickness is decreasing, the thickness. Well, now, since the thickness is increasing due to the cooler water from the Atlantic going under there, they've reverted back to talking about the actual coverage. But that's not working either because that black line is showing you again that in the last several years, it's not anywhere close to being the lowest. So how many more failed predictions do we need to hear again and again before we start looking for other causations than CO2? They're telling you that the CO2 warming is going to overpower the grand solar minimum, which is here in two years. If it's taken 35 or even 30 or even 20 years and nothing's happened yet, my bet's on listening to solar physicists and solar researchers that are giving us a warning. Time's up. Another case in point, we were told your children will never know what snow is. Yet that red line, that's record snow for the Northern Hemisphere for the last winter. What's that, strike four already? What do you think about giraffes and snow? Does this look like a normal event to you? If you don't like giraffes, how about elephants in snow? Yeah, that's normal, isn't it? Kudu in snow? Now, I'm sure the snows have come to South Africa prior, probably 1940s or turn of the century, 1880s. It's a repeating cycle. We just need to go back in time to find the exact same set of circumstances because history repeats itself. This is why the ancients worshipped the sun. This is why they were so fixated on the sky because they knew cycles repeated. And the repeating cycle affected food production, weather systems, and ultimately the society, and the leaders of the society were generally overthrown, taken out of power because they could not provide for the people, and they always blamed it on the heavens. Now, dropping in to take a look at the University of Alabama satellite temperature set here, October was supposed to be a hot month, according to the mainstream media, 0.22 degrees, or two-tenths of a degree, above the baseline from 1979 in the 30-year average. So what I also like about Dr. Spencer's research here is he shows you the area of the globe. So what I did is I just pulled this last three months, August, September, October, and notice 
in the boxes that I included there, the yellow boxes, Southern Hemisphere continues to decrease where the Arctic continues to increase, although the lower 48 of the U.S. showing some declines as well. But because in the data set it also includes last year from the same months, I thought it would line up 2017, October, Southern Hemisphere again showing the largest declines in temperature. Arctic up a little bit, but the Southern Hemisphere is decreasing far more than the Arctic's increasing. Link to everything below so you can do your own research, check out these data sets. Also at the same time, What's Up With That had a really interesting article talking about the Arctic temperature profile. Because these new temperatures were released back in October, and there were some Arctic anomalies up there, the difference in measurement is around the parallel. So Danish Meteorological Institute, the DMI, captures their temperatures from the 80 degree north latitude mark up to the North Pole, where UAH captures that data from 60 degrees north up to 90. So there's 20 degrees of distance. And remember, each degree is 60 miles. A substantial difference around the Arctic Circle where it would be warming or cooling. Now, case in point, this is from UAH's set. Notice the winter and the summer temperatures. It seems that the summer temperatures continue to be cooler year upon year, whereas the winter becomes a little bit warmer year upon year. Now, if this trend continues, just extrapolate that out for the next 30 years and see where we're going to go. So if the summer continues to be cooler, that's going to have more effects on the storm systems that form over North America. Now, my takeaway was about the cloud cells. The difference of temperatures is affecting the movement of the cloud cells themselves, and that temperature inversion or difference is what's really driving the weather systems and the formation and circulation of clouds. But what it means for you and I is polar vortex, more intense, deeper troughs pushing further south. And also in the summertime, you're going to expect warmer temperatures, the equatorial vortex. So you see the same exact thing coming off the equator, going really, really far all the way up to Norway, even further than Norway. But expect to see some of these southern polar vortices also pushing really far south. Caribbean, I would expect in the future to also experience record cold temperatures. Now, the last thing I want to mention here is energy poverty. This is literally when people cannot afford their energy prices in their homes for the winter heating and they freeze or they leave. That's one subset. But when your food doubles or triples in price, there's really no way not to eat. If you don't have electricity, you can move in with another person. You could share utilities if somebody else moves in. There's a lot of ways to, I guess, take care of that problem. Same with fuel. If it gets too expensive, you can carpool, you can take public transportation. We can't not eat. That's the problem. We cannot not eat. And there's no substitute for not eating. So as we move forward down in the timeline to 2028, I'll put out the question there. How quickly do you think these price rises are going to manifest across our society? Because everybody's going to wake up by 2020 to the plight that we're in. And once they understand they have less than seven years, six years before there's not enough food to feed this planet, at what point do they start shifting their spending habits, their investment habits, and their moral habits? And I'll leave you with that. Thanks for watching. Hope you got something out of the video. If you like this type of in-depth analysis, mini Ice Age conversations, tri-weekly podcasts, Libsyn, SoundCloud, iTunes, anywhere you can find a podcast hosted across the net, 